Oh, Ronald. Help me. The desperate cry of a young girl echoed in my ears. I rushed toward her without thinking, offering the handkerchief I had been holding to my mouth. I didn't feel anything, not even the heat. I was solely focused on saving her. But then, misfortune struck me. When I realized it, the girl was gone, and I woke up in a hospital bed. My parents were crying and yelling at me. I had survived. But the girl was. After that, I became a firefighter. I dedicated myself to saving as many lives as possible, rushing to every emergency. Yet, every time, my soul trembles. I'm scared, it's hot, I want to run away. But if I don't overcome this, I won't be myself anymore. Into my broken heart came a woman. How did you get this scar? My name is Ronald. I'm a 28-year-old firefighter. I haven't dated anyone since I broke up with my girlfriend in my sophomore year of high school. It's because people get creeped out and stay away from me when they see my right arm. My right arm, from the elbow down, is covered in red and black scars. It doesn't hurt anymore. However, both adults and children are equally frightened when they see it. In winter, I can hide it by wearing long sleeves. But in summer, when I have to wear short sleeves, some children cry at the sight of it. So, I started wearing long sleeves even in summer. Not just my arm, but I have scars on my face too, so I usually wear a mask and a hood pulled low over my head. I must look like a suspicious person to anyone who sees me. I avoid contact with others and try to live as harmlessly as possible. That was my biggest goal in life now. I don't think I was always like this. I used to be a completely different person. Hey, Ronald. Hurry up, let's go. My colleague's voice snapped me back to reality. About 80% of firefighters in the country work on a rotating shift schedule. We work 24-hour shifts, from 8.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. the next day, followed by a day off, and then another 24-hour shift. I followed the same routine, alternating between duty and off days. It was midnight. Apparently, there was a call from a restaurant, and we headed to the scene. By the time we arrived, a crowd had already gathered, peering inside anxiously. Every time I stand on the scene like this, my heart pounds loudly. I have a flashback to the scene I saw that day. But somehow, I managed to hold myself together, resisting the urge to collapse. The caller reported that the staff and customers have already evacuated. No one is left inside, so let's get right to extinguishing the fire. The fire was quickly put out. Fortunately, the restaurant was isolated, preventing the flames from spreading and minimizing the damage. This is my everyday life. After successfully completing the day's mission, I returned home around 10 a.m. and collapsed onto my bed. Unable to resist the pull of gravity, my eyelids slowly closed. And within that darkness, I heard the voice of the girl. Cough, help, help me. Watch out. I jumped out of bed, panting, staring at the wall of my room. Sweat beaded on my forehead. The scene I witnessed that day is etched deep into my memory, whether I like it or not. Every time, it's like this, and I can't stand it. Whenever I fall asleep after fighting a fire, that's the first dream I always have. It's a painful memory I'd rather erase, but it's also the event from that night when I decided to become a firefighter. The reason I injured my right arm was because of something that happened long before I became a firefighter. It was a hot, sweltering tropical night. I woke up suddenly to the smell of something burning. The clock showed the dead of night, 2 a.m. Still only 2 a.m. I mumbled, my head groggy, debating whether to go back to sleep. Then, I realized it. The smell of burning, and this feeling of drowsiness. 
There was no doubt a fire had started somewhere. I somehow managed to get up and check outside the window. The first floor of the house next door was glowing red. Oh no. I immediately ran downstairs to wake my sleeping parents. Both of them, like me, were suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning, and their consciousness was foggy. I managed to wake my father and had him carry my mother out. Fortunately, the fire hadn't spread to our house yet, but if we had been a moment later, it could have been disastrous for our family. Gradually, bystanders began to gather, and the fire department, which my father had called, arrived. But then, I noticed something. There was a little girl looking at us from a second floor window. She was too terrified to scream. Even without hearing her voice, I knew she was begging for help. The firefighters noticed her and were about to start the rescue, but my body moved on its own. Stop, it's dangerous, go back. I heard voices shouting, but I charged into the sea of flames without thinking. Covering my mouth with a handkerchief to avoid inhaling too much smoke, I rushed up to the second floor. There, in what seemed like a child's bedroom, was the girl. Please help. The moment she saw me, she clung to me and began sobbing loudly. I held her tightly and hurried down the stairs. And that's when it happened. With a deafening roar, a dark shadow fell over us. That's when I lost consciousness. The next thing I knew, I was waking up in a hospital bed. My parents scolded me terribly. Especially my mother, her anger was beyond description. I even imagined horns growing on her head like a demon. That's how reckless I had been. At 18, in my senior year of high school, I had to give up on taking the college entrance exams. After that, I managed to go through rehabilitation and eventually got discharged. Luckily, I didn't have any major lasting injuries. But my right arm was left scarred. Apparently, when the burned, decaying furniture fell, it landed on me and the girl. Fortunately, thanks to my reflexes, I avoided a direct hit, but my right arm was injured when I used it to shield myself from the falling furniture. They said it was a miracle I got away with just a minor injury. That's why, despite the severity of how it looks, the pain wasn't so bad. Not getting seriously injured, that alone was enough. However, this would eventually turn my life upside down. People began to feel uneasy when they saw my scars, and I could no longer attend classes. I ended up going to the school nurse's office and started thinking about my future. That's when I made a decision. I want to become a firefighter. I want to enroll in a fire academy. My parents were shocked when they heard this. My mother was so surprised she almost fell over. They probably thought that what happened that day had become a trauma for me. But that wasn't the case. I had felt something well up from deep within my chest at that time. Remembering the girl I saved with my own body, I realized how proud and wonderful it was to have a job where you could help people. By the way, the girl was only slightly dazed from inhaling smoke, she hadn't been injured. By shielding her, I was able to save a life. That was what sparked my interest in becoming a firefighter. Naturally, my parents opposed the idea. Saving lives sometimes means you have to sacrifice your own. They told me not to make such a decision so lightly. It was understandable. I knew that very well. But my determination was firm. Eventually, I was allowed to enter the fire academy. Just thinking back on those days, living under strict rules in a fully residential school, makes me feel queasy. But it was because of those tough days that I got to witness the bravery of firefighters risking their lives for others. I tried to make sure my training days were not wasted. However, instinct is ingrained deep in your soul. Every time I see the scene of a fire, my legs freeze, and the images from that day flash back. Even if my mind tells me I'm okay, 
My soul rejects it. That's how it feels. Well, there's no point in dwelling on it. More importantly, I wonder if she's doing well. No one answers my muttered words. The girl I saved moved away after I was discharged from the hospital, and I have no information about her. I think her parents were terrible people. Her father went out every night, and her mother, resentful of him, ignored him, making the house feel gloomy. I didn't see it firsthand, but I overheard my parents talking about it. Living next door to her, I treated her like a real little sister. Her name was Caitlin. Caitlin, let's go to the park. Wait up, Ronald. Because her parents were like that, my parents and I were really worried about Caitlin. From her parents' perspective, they probably thought it was lucky that we were all playing with her and feeding her. They likely thought they'd rather spend on themselves than feed their own child. I'm sure that's what they thought. We knew this, but we still cared for Caitlin. My mother, after years of fertility treatments, had me in her late 30s. So, not having her dream of a daughter fulfilled made Caitlin even more precious to her. Not family, but not a stranger either. That was the relationship between my family and Caitlin. In the end, I lost track of her after that day. Sigh. Why does it always have to be like this? I'm really pathetic. I let out a slow sigh and crawled back under the covers. After that, I slept like a log. The next time I woke up, it was around 5 p.m. The sky had turned a deep red, and I saw crows returning to the forest, cawing as they went. I hadn't eaten anything since coming back, and hunger was starting to make me feel sick. I opened the refrigerator, only to find it completely empty. Living alone with such an irregular lifestyle, there's no one to go grocery shopping for me. I thought about ordering delivery, but I couldn't decide what I wanted, so I pulled up my hood and headed outside. Even though it was a hot summer day, I must have stood out quite a bit dressed like that. People passing by shot strange looks my way. But I was used to it by now. While I was casually picking out some meat at the supermarket, a woman standing next to me said, You might want to wait a bit longer. Some items will go on sale soon. Ha! Huh? When I turned to look, she was smiling brightly like the sun. Judging by the uniform peeking out from under her hoodie, she seemed like a high school student. It's not particularly unusual for a high schooler to be at a supermarket, but hearing her talk about a sale caught me off guard. Just as she said, music began playing, signaling the start of a sale. I usually buy chicken breasts to save money, but since the prices had dropped, I decided to get some pork belly and added some yakisoba noodles to my basket, thinking I might make yakisoba tonight. Then, once again, that high school girl stood beside me and said, If you're looking for noodles, there's a store a little further ahead that's cheaper. Aha! Uh -huh. Feeling annoyed, I tried to ignore her and walk away, but she suddenly grabbed my arm. Wondering what she was doing, I glared at her. She immediately let go of my arm and raised both hands beside her face. Sorry, you just looked a bit like someone I know. I didn't mean to be a bother, I'm sorry. I watched her walk away, shoulders slumped, with a puzzled expression on my face. A bright smile and a cheerful personality. She was walking a path completely opposite to mine, there was no way we could know each other. That day, I went home with that thought in mind and enjoyed my chicken yakisoba noodles while watching TV. So, why are you here? A few days later, I ran into her again at the store where she had told me the noodles were cheaper. You remembered what I told you. But you know, if you eat yakisoba noodles all the time, your diet will become unbalanced. Mind your own business. But she didn't seem to give up. For some reason, she followed me around, 
suggesting dishes and putting things into my basket one after another. As I watched her in bewilderment, a question that had been on my mind suddenly slipped out. Where are your parents? Why are you shopping alone? She stopped moving instantly. A moment of silence fell over us, but then she turned back and smiled softly. I live alone. When I was little, I got separated from my parents due to some circumstances. Now, my relatives provide me with financial support. So I live by myself. But it's fun, so it's okay. She said it, but her expression didn't seem to match her words at all. Caitlin's face and the girl standing before me overlapped perfectly in my mind. The way Caitlin looked up at me and this girl's eyes, they were exactly the same. No way. Without realizing it, I raised my arm and reached out toward her. She glanced at my right arm and muttered. That scar. I snapped back to reality, quickly pulling my arm back and tugging my sleeve down hard. She saw my scar, she's going to be disgusted. Thinking that, I was about to turn away from her when she spoke up first. Ronald. It really is you, Ronald. The high school girl, no, Caitlin, shouted, her eyes brimming with tears. People around us started to look at me suspiciously. I sighed, told her we'd talk later, and quickly paid for my groceries before heading outside. Carrying Caitlin's bags as well, I walked down a long, straight path. Caitlin followed a step behind me, maintaining a small distance, silently walking along. As we reached a fork in the road, Caitlin spoke. Ronald, will you come to my place next time? What are you talking about? Of course not. Please. There's something I need to tell you, something I have to say. Her eyes didn't seem to be lying. They were so clear, so beautiful, that they seemed to draw me in. In the end, I gave in to Caitlin's persistence and promised to come by tomorrow. Coincidentally, I happened to have two days off in a row, but what were the odds of that happening? Thinking about that, I found myself visiting Caitlin the next day. When Caitlin learned about the unhealthy lifestyle I'd been living, she prepared a nutritionally balanced meal for me. There was eggplant, which I disliked. No way. You have to eat it. You can't be picky. She seemed to read my mind, catching me off guard. However, when I tasted Caitlin's cooking, the unpleasant taste of eggplant that I had always avoided was hardly noticeable. I was so impressed that, before I knew it, I had finished the whole plate. Caitlin smiled triumphantly. After finishing her dinner, Caitlin sat down beside me and continued the story from that day. Ronald, you've changed a lot. Back then, you seemed brighter. Ten years have passed, such changes are only natural. A brief silence fell, but Caitlin began to speak hesitantly. That night, when I shielded her and lost consciousness, she was safe but kept calling my name over and over. The firefighters rescued her and brought her to safety. It seems the fire was caused by her father's carelessness with a cigarette. As usual, he had been drinking at home, and when he went out, he left the cigarette burning. I'd never hated my parents, not even once. Sure, my dad was probably a deadbeat, but he never did anything to harm me. He just wasn't interested in me. And mom, she stayed at home, even when dad went out at night, because she didn't want to leave me alone. It seemed like she thought as long as you and your family looked after me, she only needed to take care of the minimum. Yeah, we all understood that. But I see, your mother did have at least a basic sense of responsibility, even if it was minimal. Caitlin chuckled softly. Yeah, I guess so. But that day, my mom had a seizure due to her chronic illness. Fortunately, she was rescued by the firefighters before me, so she was safe. 
Caitlin's expression darkened. Her father, as usual, was out and wasn't caught in the fire. Her mother was found collapsed at the entrance by the firefighters and was quickly taken outside and sent to the hospital. However, Caitlin, who was asleep on the second floor, wasn't discovered right away. That's when I, a high school student at the time, recklessly rushed in and rescued her. Caitlin didn't suffer any major injuries, but because she had inhaled smoke, she was taken to the hospital. They found no serious issues, and she was discharged three days later. However, it wasn't her parents who took her in but her maternal relatives. After that incident, her parents had a massive argument and ended up divorcing. Her mother deeply regretted that she hadn't cared for Caitlin properly and had endangered her life. She entrusted Caitlin to her relatives. That was the outcome for Caitlin's family. I'm sorry for wrongly assuming your parents were terrible in saying such things. It's okay. Compared to most parents, they were deadbeats, so I don't mind. My mom just realized things too late. After that day, when I was seven, what happened became a trauma, and I spent quite some time withdrawn. After being taken in by relatives, Caitlin was a shut-in through elementary and middle school. She said there were times she wanted to see me. But knowing that I was injured because I had protected her, she felt she had no face to meet me and never reached out. We were only neighbors, so we hadn't exchanged personal contact information. However, Caitlin said she happened to see me in town one day and felt compelled to approach me. Well, if someone dresses like such a suspicious person, they're bound to stand out, right? At first, I thought you were some creepy guy. But I couldn't stop thinking about those eyes I saw peeking out from under the hood. They looked just like Ronald's. I had never regretted these scars, not once. That's precisely why I chose to become a firefighter. But people who don't know the story furrow their brows when they see my arm. One time, a mother I didn't know told me to stay away from her child because I looked creepy. My scars were proof that I had saved a life, a badge of honor, if you will. But over time, they became swallowed by a wave of negative emotions. And so, gradually, I started to close off my heart. When I told her this, Caitlin looked at me with a serious expression and said, Even if you've been exposed to those kinds of looks and your legs have frozen up at the scene, you're still working as a firefighter, aren't you? That means you still see those scars as a badge of honor, don't you? Looking into her sincere eyes, I heard something inside me begin to crumble. The door that had shut my heart so tightly shattered into pieces. You're right. I, I have never once regretted saving you, Caitlin. These scars are the marks of victory I got for saving my dear friend. And yet, I've closed off my heart like this. As my shoulders began to shake slowly, Caitlin gently embraced me. She rubbed my back softly, as if comforting a child. Just like my late parents had once done for me, and like I had done for young Caitlin, now Caitlin was doing the same for me. Sorry, can I lean on your shoulder for a bit? Ronald, sometimes it's okay to cry. Who knows how much time passed after that. I knew I couldn't just stay in Caitlin's apartment forever, so I decided to head back home. Caitlin looked at me with a slightly forlorn expression, her eyes like those of an abandoned puppy. Seeing that look brought back memories. After having dinner at my house, when Caitlin's mother returned from work to take her home, she would look at me with that same expression. I narrowed my eyes slightly and gently patted her head. Ronald, you know, I always wanted to say something if I ever met you again. I just wanted to say, thank you for saving me that day. At that moment, I felt a weight lift off my heart. It felt like that, somehow. The next day, when I arrived at work as usual, 
My co-workers looked at me with curious expressions. What is it? Well, you seem different somehow. Up until now, you had a kind of a dark aura around you. What is that? I'm not a middle schooler with a delusion complex. At that, my co-worker burst into laughter and continued getting ready. It wasn't just him, my boss and my juniors also asked me the same question. I knew it myself. Reuniting with Caitlin and hearing her gratitude for what happened that day. That alone was enough to save my heart. If I hadn't saved Caitlin and gotten these scars back then, maybe my life would have been completely different. I might have gone to college, gotten a good job, married a girlfriend. I'd considered those things, too. But the moment she thanked me yesterday, my heart was finally freed from the past. After that, I noticed a change in myself. Until now, every time I went to a scene, my soul would scream no, trying to take control of my body, but that stopped entirely. Though my heart and soul had been disconnected, they now felt unified. In my heart, I wanted to save as many lives as possible, just like when I saved Caitlin. In my soul, I never wanted to experience such fear again. Those two conflicting thoughts, like water and oil, had now blended together perfectly. Of course, there is still fear. Being a firefighter is a dangerous job, constantly on the edge of life and death. But there isn't a hint of negative emotion anymore. All I had was a sense of duty. Ronald. To the right. Got it. I coordinated well with my colleagues, handling firefighting and rescue operations. And so, the years passed. Ronald, if you do that again, I'll be mad. All right, I'm sorry. The reason I was being scolded was because I had secretly pushed the green peppers, my next least favorite after eggplant, to the side of my plate. Caitlin, seeing this, immediately reacted, scolding me with a stern face as if she had grown horns like a demon. Recently, I've been spending more time with Caitlin. Caitlin turned 20 and is currently a second-year university student. She still receives support from her relatives, but she's also very smart and is attending a nearby university on a scholarship. The Caitlin I remember was the little girl who would tug on my clothes with her tiny hands, asking me to take her to the park. But now, she's grown into a fine young woman who even cooks meals for me like this. I'm sure Caitlin will make a wonderful wife someday. When I thought that, a pang of pain hit my chest. I didn't know why, but the thought of Caitlin getting married somehow didn't sit right with me. It was a strange feeling. Oblivious to my thoughts, Caitlin kept piling green peppers onto my plate. Hey, I don't need this many. This is punishment for pushing them aside. Unable to argue, I quietly ate the green peppers. The bitterness spread in my mouth, but because Caitlin had seasoned them well, swallowing them wasn't too hard. After I managed to finish, Caitlin pulled a beer out of the refrigerator. I'm not drinking yet. Oh, come on. Are you still treating me like a kid? I'm an adult now. I can drink alcohol. She puffed her cheeks in a playful pout. She had just celebrated her birthday recently. Thinking about that, I felt how quickly time had passed. Because of my job, I have to be ready for emergencies. So, even when I'm off duty, I don't drink, but I had no reason to stop her from drinking. Caitlin took a swig of the beer with a hearty gulp. She drank quite well. It seemed she had a strong tolerance for alcohol, perhaps because of her father, who used to drink heavily but never got drunk. My dad loved to drink, remember? He could drink a lot and never get drunk, even though my mom couldn't handle alcohol at all. She said this, smiling with her cheeks slightly flushed. As I sipped my non-alcoholic beer and chatted, Caitlin made a surprising proposal. Hey, Ronald, why don't we live together? 
I spat out the non-alcoholic beer I was drinking. Hey, that's gross. You said something weird. I took a deep breath to calm myself down. Caitlin, perhaps a little tipsy, began to speak more honestly than usual. To me, you'll always be my big brother. Is it strange to want to live with family? Even though I live apart from my mom now, I still feel lonely. Apparently, Caitlin's mother, out of guilt, hasn't shown herself in front of Caitlin since the incident. But Caitlin sometimes receives letters from her through her relatives. She showed them to me. Written in elegant handwriting, they expressed a mother's feelings for her daughter. You realize what's important only after you've lost it. That's what mom said. In her own way, she seems to have always loved me. When I was little, I adored you and your family more than my own parents because you cared for me. But now that I'm an adult, I understand. Mom just doesn't have worldly wisdom, but she truly loved me. With that, Caitlin held her mother's letter close to her heart, as if it were precious. What her mother did might not be something easily forgiven, though. It may sound like a touching story because Caitlin understands and forgives. But the reality remains that her mother left her daughter in the care of another family. Still, I was grateful to Caitlin's mother. Not only for giving birth to Caitlin but also for trusting us enough to leave her daughter in our care. Because of that trust, Caitlin and I were able to form a strong bond and reunite even after 10 years. So, I decided to stop saying anything about her mother will do when you graduate from university. What? Seeing Caitlin's exaggerated surprise, I couldn't help but smile. A few more years passed after that. I turned 35, and Caitlin was now 24. It had been two years since she graduated from university and started working. She seemed to have gotten used to her job and had even begun complaining about it recently. Listen to this. Today, my manager, Tim. All right, all right, go take a bath first. Reluctantly, Caitlin headed to the bathroom. After Caitlin graduated from university, as promised, we started living together. And there was another change. I had retired from being an active firefighter. But I hadn't switched to a completely unrelated job. I was now working as an instructor at the fire academy, training the next generation of firefighters. Although I still had a lot to learn, I worked hard every day not to let down the former colleagues and seniors who commended me for this position. Then, Caitlin came out of the shower with her hair still wet. You'll catch a cold. Come here. Without saying a word, Caitlin sat down in front of me. Drying Caitlin's long, glossy hair had become a routine for us. Though Caitlin seemed quite put together, she had some absent-minded tendencies. Mixing up sugar and salt, tripping over nothing etc. And sometimes, like now, coming out without drying her hair. Seeing this, I had taken it upon myself to dry her hair with a hairdryer. She's quite a handful, little sister of mine. As her hair dried, I lowered the hairdryer to a gentler setting, and Caitlin, in a cheerful mood, asked. So, have you thought about my question from the other day? No, I haven't. Oh, come on. How long are you going to make me wait? You only have one more day. I ran the comb through her hair, saying, yeah, yeah. And finally, I realized what that strange feeling was. While I called her my little sister, a different emotion was beginning to take hold of my heart. There was no doubt that I was becoming aware of Caitlin as a woman. Not just as the little sister who always followed me around but as a woman in her own right. Even though there was a significant age gap between us, 24 and 35 are both mature ages. Caitlin must have noticed my feelings. That's why she was pressing me for an answer. 
Recently, Caitlin had stopped treating me as big brother. At first, I thought it was just familial love. I wanted to live with you forever, thinking it was just a sisterly feeling. But recently, I realized something. The feelings I have for you are different from those I have for my mother or the relatives who raised me. Ronald. Do I have to let go of these feelings? Hearing something like that, I couldn't help but become conscious of it. But I still had doubts about whether I was truly the right partner for her. Oddly enough, the one who pushed me forward was Caitlin's mother. One day, while Caitlin was at work and I was off, her mother appeared, almost as if she had timed it perfectly. Are you Ronald, who used to live next door? Oh, I see, so much time has passed. You've grown up. If you're living with her, does that mean what I think it does? She was still like the icy person I remembered. But now there was an air of someone who had let go of something. When I told her that although Caitlin and I were living together, we were still not quite lovers, she was genuinely shocked. At the same time, she said this. If you keep dragging your feet like this, you'll end up regretting it. I, in the end, couldn't do anything for her. Even on that day, if I hadn't had a seizure, she wouldn't have had to go through such a scary experience. I was the worst kind of mother, relying on the kindness of your family. So, I have no intention of acting like her mother now, but I have to tell you this. If you're going to end up regretting it, then tell her how you feel. Don't turn out like me. With that, she left. An hour later, as if to replace her, Caitlin came home. As soon as she opened the front door, she asked. Did mom come by, by any chance? She seemed to have guessed from the faint lingering scent of osmanthus. Scent is something that easily sticks in a person's memory. It's called the Proust effect. Caitlin must have remembered her mother's scent unconsciously, something she had known since she was little. Hey, how long are you going to keep doing that? Her voice pulled me back to reality. I had been combing the same spot repeatedly, and she, growing impatient, had spoken up. I apologized, stood up, and put the comb back in its place. When I turned around, Caitlin was staring at me with a serious expression. I held my breath. And then, I made up my mind. Caitlin, I've decided. I won't lie about or hide my feelings any longer. But doing so might ruin the relationship we've built up until now. Are you ready to move forward, knowing that? Caitlin blinked for a moment, then burst out laughing. After giggling for a bit, she gave me that bright, sun-like smile again and replied. I'm actually hoping for it to break down. But you know, it doesn't just end when it falls apart. Like building blocks, we can rebuild it. Just in a different shape this time. With those words, I gently pulled her into an embrace. Caitlin had two roles in my life. One was as my little sister. But that was now in the past. From this moment on, Caitlin would be reborn as something else. For the rest of my life, I knew I wouldn't be able to live without her. You don't have to hide that scar anymore, do you? Yeah, from now on, I'll live as myself. And with that, we both laughed together. <laughs>